session, uh, the conference. My name is Dr. Shaul Sharf. I'm lecturer and researcher uh, in constitutional law at the Paris Academic Center. I will moderate this session, which includes four excellent speakers. This is the first uh, session after lunch, so we kept the best speakers to keep you all awake. <laughs> the main uh, concept of the session is the role of the regions in expanding solidarity and peace and, uh, and the development of uh, humanism in the world. Uh, in the first part, we will hear the speakers. In the second part, we will have a discussion between the speakers, and if there is a time left, the audience will be able to ask, uh, ask questions. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our first speaker, Professor Asher Maoz, to present the keynote of the session, which called Religions, Human Solidarity, and a Global Peace, a Jurek uh, Approach. Professor Asher Maoz is founding dean Paris Academic Law School and head of, of Committee on International Academic uh, Relations. Professor Maoz taught at the leading universities around the world. He is the vice honorary president of the IADLR and member of I. RLA experts. He served as academic advisor of the Knesset on adopting a, a constitution for the state of Israel and was chair of the state commission on a journalist privilege. He wrote several books and published over 100 academic articles and book chapters. He is also co-organizer of this conference. Please, Professor Moss. Thank you, Shauli. Uh, if I return back to my opening remarks yesterday, uh, I guess you agreed with me that there is a lot of good in all religion, religions, but somehow the result is very poor. And uh, the answer to overcome it, the usual answer is tolerance. We need tolerance. And I don't like this word for several reasons. Uh, First of all, religious tolerance seems problematic. If you know that truth lies with you, why should you tolerate opposite teachings? Why should you sanction the freedom to practice a religion that you know to be false? The answer is simple, you don't know. Religion is based on belief, not on knowledge. If it could be proven scientifically that one religion is true while all others are false, then certainly all mankind would follow that which is true. But that would certainly be the end of religion. Religion would turn into science. If religion is based on belief as it is, then your belief is not superior to others. If we share this notion, then we must respect the beliefs of others just as we wish them to respect ours. Uh, so the term I would prefer is respect, not tolerance. Tolerance has tolerance has a very is a very bad term. You tolerate something that is inferior, and actually, if you tolerate something that is inferior, it shows that you are such a great person. Although you are superior to the others, you nevertheless tolerate them. They are not worth of being tolerated, but you should respect them just as, as you want them to respect your religion. And by respecting their religion, you respect your own religion. Okay, let me make a future point. Those who are less versed in their religion tend to be more extreme, as if to make up for the lack of knowledge of or even of religiosity you usually it will be the those who don't know their own religion that would tend to be zealots of the of their religion it is therefore incumbent upon religious leaders to explore the noble ideo ideologies of their religion and to restrain the zealots genuine religious leaders should abolish the misuse of religious teachings to enable hatred violence in the secretion of human dignity. I would make a further point. We are all scared of that which we don't know. It is therefore crucial that we get to know each other's religion. Religious leaders should convene and work out understanding and common policies for a brighter future. And that's what a conference like ours does. In the remaining minutes, I would like to summarize the Jewish attitude to other religions, I would say in a nutshell. 
And I would suggest that it could be served as a model to other religions as well. The Jewish people, to take one story, are com were commanded to rejoice on the festival of tabernacles, but not on Passover. And Passover, as, as you all know, whether you are Jewish or Gentiles, is the most important uh, festival. That's the festival when we became a nation. When we stopped to be slaves and became a nation, we are not allowed to rejoice on that, on that holiday. Uh, and the reason is, and I quote, because the Egyptians died. How did they die? They died when they were chasing the children of Israel to return them to slavery. And then they drowned in the Red Sea. Um, for the same reason, the full prayer of uh, rejoicing, Hallel. How do you translate Hallel? You must know. Can I not be asked a question here? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. No, he knows much better than I do. <laughs> At least he can. And it is not recited on Passover, save for the first day. And again, for you shall not rejoice in the downfall of your enemy, and your heart will not be made glad by his failure. There's another passage in the Talmud. After, you know, after the Egyptians drowned in the sea and the children of Israel came out, they started singing. And God looked at them and said, how dare you sing when my creatures are drowned in the, in the water? And that's the reason that on Passover, which should be really the, the, the happiest holiday for the Jews, we are not allowed to be that, that, uh, uh, that happy. Now, another issue throughout the throughout the entire seven days of the festival of Tabernacles, 70 bullocks were sacrificed in the temple, and I quote, for the 70 nations. At that time, they believed there are only 70 nations, and maybe there were no more. Today, I don't know how many we have. In this context, the Talmud states, vote to the idol worshippers who have suffered a loss, but do not know what they have suffered, what they have lost. When the temple was standing, the altar, the altar could atone for them. And now, who will atone for them? I mean, look at all. You ruined our temple. It's not just our temple. You, you ruined your, your future, you ruined your destiny. This episode is typical of the Jewish attitude to non-Jews. It corresponds with the commandment to pray, to pray for the welfare, for the wealth of the nation where Jews live. It corresponds with the commandments to treat the stranger that sojourns with the Jewish people with love and full rights equal to the rights of the Jewish citizen. In a minute, I'll show you it's not equal, but you'll surprise why. The reason being, for, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Maybe if God, God inflicted of us to be slaves, it's because for us to have a memory, remember where it came from. And uh, Okay, already in ancient times, in Etosefta, which is a passage of the Mishnah that didn't enter into the Talmud, we are, we are it ruled that, and I, and I quote, the poor among the non-Jews are supported together, together with the poor of Israel, and the sick among the non-Jews are visited together with the sick of Israel. And the dead of the non-Jews are buried together with the dead of Israel. And eulogies are said over the dead, over their dead, and their mourners be comforted. The most accurate statement of the Jewish attitude was voiced, in my opinion, by Prophet Micha, who said, all the nations may walk in the name of their gods, we will walk in the name of the Lord, our God, forever and ever. 
It is not just a matter of tolerance. It is not tolerance, it's respect. Micha, if Micha says you are allowed to follow your religion, if your religion was false, knowingly, he, he wouldn't have allowed it. You tolerate, you don't tolerate, you respect. In Judaic theology, the Lord seems to entertain, moreover, a dual character. He's the God of Israel, yet at the same time, he's the Lord of universe. Accordingly, there are two sets of rules, one for the Jews, the other for the rest of the world. They were both given by one and the same God. Rabbi Joseph Albo, a leading religious philosopher in the Middle Ages, even admitted the existence of two divine Torahs. He didn't distinguish between them. At the same time, for different nations. There is one thing that Judaism demands from other religion, to respect the seven Noahide commandments. Now the seven Noahide, by the way, out of the seven Noahide commandments, there is a theory that appears in the Talmud that five were given already to Adam and Eve. And whether Adam or Noah, it were given to, to the human being when the, when the Jewish people did not, did not exist yet. Abraham was not born and certainly not Jacob. This com, they, these uh, are the commandments that were given by God at the covenant of the rainbow following the flood. The covenant was made between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth, emphasizing God's promise that neither shall all flesh be cut off anymore by the waters of a flood, neither shall there anyone be a, a, there be a flood to destroy the earth. The seven Ohite commandments are principles of basic moral characters, described by some philosophers as rules of natural law. A Gentile that keeps the seven Noahide commandments is regarded righteous among the nations, and his share in, is in the world to come. If a quote from Maimonides was uh, referred to by Chief Rabbi, Lando, uh, Chief Rabbi Lau yesterday, Maimonides in his word says, whoever among the nations fulfills the seven commandments to serve God belongs to the righteous among the nations and has a share in the world to come. Now, this commandment, save perhaps for two of them, which are of religious nature, to the believing God and not to worship idols, are, are rules of, of a just common decency. I think every decent person, whether he knows or not, he follows the Noahide laws. There is not much to do there. When, do, when can, we, can we Jews inherit the world to come? I will refer to the Mishnah, which is part of the Talmud, the more ancient part, and I'll quote Rabbi Eliezer. There is a difference between righteous Jews and righteous Gentiles. The Jews are not called righteous unless they observe the entire Torah. The righteous Gentiles, however, are called righteous because they observe the seven Noahide uh, laws. I guess, I guess you know how many commandments we have to observe, 613. So if there is a discrimination in Judaism, it's against the Jews. There is a 613 vis-a-vis -vis seven. Um, Rabbi Shlomo Goran, the founding chaplain of the Israeli army, refers to the biblical commandment you shall love your neighbor as yourself, and concludes the principle refers to universal fraternity, and fraternity applies not only among the Jewish people themselves, but to love the, to the love of mankind in general, for in the image of God made him men. In this regard, it is worthwhile mentioning a traditional Judaic commentary on why God created a single man as opposed to a community of people. Why did he have to create Adam and Eve and, and order them or bless them multiply? Why couldn't he already, already uh, create a, a community of people? Why did he need the help of Adam and Eve? And the reason given, therefore each, each one ought to say, it is for me alone that the world was created. 
The idea is giving practical application in the caution administered by the Jewish religious courts to witnesses in criminal cases. The court must warn them not to give hearsay say, or speculative evidence. Man was created single, the court says, to teach that whoever destroys one human life is deemed by scriptures to have destroyed the whole universe. And if a man saves a single soul, scriptures regard him as having saved the whole world. Another interesting reason given for the creation of a single individual is that no one may be heard to say to another, my father was greater than yours. We all have one father. We all stem from the same father. This reminds us of another statement in the Bible, in Psalms, have we not all one father, had not one God created us. Professor Boas Cohen blends this verse with philo, Jude, Jude, with philo philosophy, philo of Alexandria, and states, as for the Republic of Humanity, Judaism teaches that all citizens have one father and one God created them all. Uh, much of this has been said today about that the idea of human dignity, that if you respect human dignity, respect God, and if you disrespect a person, you disrespect God. Thomas Paine, by the way, said that this idea in its Judaic version that I've just in short detail stands behind the idea of the American uh, constitution and uh, that all men were created equal. Returning to Micha's prophecy, we are told that in the end of the days, all nations will go up to the mountain of the Lord and will be given a Torah for all mankind. In those days, all people shall beat their swords into flesh, into plowshares, and their spears into running hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Uh, I would like to say one thing. There is some dispute in, in uh, the Jewish uh, sources what Torah is going to, God to give us. Is it, is it the Torah of the Jews? Why, why is it the Torah of the Jews? God told them you may respect your own Torah. We had to Torah. And there is an idea that God is going to give us in the end of the days, a new Torah that will combine all human beings. And with this promise of Micha, what will happen when we all respect the law, I think it's fit, fit to, to conclude this, my part. I didn't, I didn't just pass my time, did I? Going. If not, I can go on. I have another <laughs> hundred pages. You have another uh, five minutes. If you want. I think I can stay here because the next one is by... Uh... Okay. Thank you, then... Professor Mount. Our second speaker, uh, Professor Adelaide Madeira, uh, is not here. So we'll uh, watch a video showing her position regarding the Catholic Church and the promotion of international humanitarian law. Professor Madeira is full professor at the Department of Law of the University of Messina in Italy. Her expertise includes canon law, law and religion, comparative religious laws, and religious factor anti-discrimination law. She's the author of four books and several academic writings. Her research activities focus on the interrelationship between law and religion, specifically church state relationship, religious organization, and the law. Let's watch Professor Madeira's lecture. Pini. Uh, so, hello, my name is Adelaide Madera, and uh, I, I 
would like to thank the organizers of this first meeting for inviting me. The title for the day paper is The Role of the Catholic Church in the Field of International Humanitarian Law. Uh, so the interplay between religion and international humanitarian law has been defined uh, as controversial and complex. Historical, the connection between religion and international law has relied on the traditional uh, reasoning of the just war. Also, historically, religion has been a divisive factor which has been used to justify war, discrimination, and persecution. Thus, the crucial question is whether and to what extent religion has a place in modern international humanitarian law in the pursuit of the creation of a culture of values. There is little doubt that the implementation of humanitarian law is facing new challenges because of multiple factors such as disrespect and distrust by no state armed groups or state reluctance to enforce its provisions. Thus, new strategical approaches are required to promote compliance with humanitarian norms. Commentators have well documented that the compliance with humanitarian law of parties more directly involved in armed conflict is a matter of degree varying with the circumstances of the case and that huge, a more active role of religious communities. Actually, religious leaders can be game changers in the implementation of humanitarian law because of the influence of the faith communities where they are considered as authoritative voices because of tradition and charisma. They can provide guidelines where they solicit compliance with the humanitarian law in order to affect the conduct of their religious communities. In this way, voluntary compliance with humanitarian law can be implemented because of perceived legitimacy of religious leaders. The pursuit of the development of the internalization process. About the Catholic Church, it cannot be underestimated that the Catholic Church has traditionally played a key role in the field of international and humanitarian law, even in the case of armed conflict, where it has exercised a valuable influence as a religious non state actor. On different occasions, it has kept putting pressure on governments to act in compliance with humanitarian law to respect the standard of proportionality in order to protect those who do not take part in armed conflicts and those who do not take active part uh, to restrict methods and means of warfare and to prevent prevent damage to the cultural heritage and the natural environment also the main principles which guide the canonical legal systems have uh, facilitated a reading of religious doctrine which promotes compliance with international humanitarian law. The universal vocation of its message implies recognition of equal dignity and worth of every human person, love and mercy to our neighbor because of the shared belonging to the human family. The Catholic Church and its religiously affiliated organizations have been traditionally engaged in the field of pastoral activity, delivery of education, welfare, and healthcare, even in the context of crisis, where its intervention is extensive and multidimensional. Before the humanitarian law was enforced, religious organizations had a long tradition of providing charitable assistance to communities in a situation of crisis and emergency with specific regard to the most vulnerable classes of individuals. Such undertakings have successfully integrated the humanitarian commitment and the religious mission, enjoy the support of religiously committed volunteers, multiple sources of access to funding, strong management structure. Religiously affiliated organizations have provided emergency and rebuilding intervention in war theaters, supporting the development of local communities and safeguarding minorities. 
They have served all people, regardless of the religious affiliation, without imposing a value protection. They have reinforced the resilience of local communities, speaking the shared language of human dignity, social justice, and civil peace. The hierarchical organization of its structure guarantees the uniformity of its legal provisions and prevents contradictory interpretations of its tenets in different geographical contexts. Given the current lack of organizational structures and resources at the state level aimed at disseminating the humanitarian law and facilitating its incorporation in the rules of the parties is involved, the Catholic Church has given a significant support. Also, it has the opportunity to mobilize significant human and financial resources to offer immediate and programmatic responses to situations of, of crisis and emergency. As an example, in Myanmar, Catholic clerics living in rural areas affected by war have the opportunity to then negotiate the evacuation of civilians from the war theater with conflicting parties. The, also, the, the Catholic Church has a double channel to act in the, in the international field. Not only does it perform uh, its humanitarian activity through its organizations, but also through its institutional presence, the Holy See and all the with international personality, which gives it the possibility to participate in humanitarian diplomacy. So since the pontificate of Paul VI, the Holy See has played a significant role in the international community. Until the Second Council Vatican, Catholic doctrine supported the idea of the legitimacy of war when it was aimed to protect the common good. However, such an idea of war has been subject to a drastic change under Pope John XXIII, who have found that relationships between different, different political communities has to be, has to be based on justice. Furthermore, since the development of sophisticated modern weapons, the church has gradually abandoned the adopting of the fair war as a means of legitimate defense that it has justified humanitarian intervention only when it is necessary as an extreme solution. So in the, Catholic, in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the permanent validity of the moral law during our conflict has, has been strongly uh, reiterated. So the Holy See has given a strong contribution to the dissemination of the humanitarian law. We cannot underestimate the key role of the Catholic Church in the formation of the Catholic and military chapters in international humanitarian law within its members of the International Conference of the Red Cross and Red Crescent. So the formation of military chaplains has a pivotal role in the interpretation of humanitarian law. John Paul II, in his message to the participants of uh, to the first international course for the formation of Catholic military settings in humanitarian law, defined humanitarian law not only as a juridical code, but also as an ethical code. He relied on the traditional Christian view of man inspired, that inspired the tendency to mitigate the traditional ferocity of war. So the Church of the Catholic Church, as I said before, reiterated its commitment to prevent the use of, uh, of arms uh, in uh, the Catholic Catechism of the Catholic Church, but where it uh, Reiterated the permanent validity of the moral law during armed conflict, but also we cannot underestimate uh, that it reiterated its commitment to prevent the use of scientific arms in defense, as well as manifesting its opposition to autonomous weapons. Recently, uh, Pope Francis, with regard to protocol additional second on the protection of victims of non-international armed conflict, underlined the certain omissions and hesitation. He emphasized the need, even in the theaters of war, for a challenge of heart, an opening to God and one's neighbor, 
and to encourage people to overcome, overcome the difference and to experience solidarity as a moral virtue and a social attitude that they could be capable of inspiring a commitment on behalf of suffering individuals. He also emphasized the contribution of individual caregivers can offer where humanitarian law presents exception and omission. And then he also expressed hope that humanitarian organizations act in accordance with principles of humanity, impartiality, neutrality, and autonomy. So he underlined that, that the individual conscience may be able to acknowledge that the moral duty to respect and protect the dignity of every human person in every circumstance. Thus, the five day pop awards catalyzed attention on the powerful role of religious actors and claimed the implementation of humanitarian law. Finally, the Catholic Church has demonstrated its ability to open channels of dialogue with the government and other religious communities, with the view to establishing a common ground where shared goals are concerned. Well, the next step should be the development of strong synergic partnerships between religious and state actors, <coughs> other secular or interfaith non governmental organization, organizations, to implement the delivery of humanitarian assistance. Such a cooperation raises new issues concerning accountability, public monitoring personalization of service. However, coordination of action would improve the effectiveness of a humanitarian response, both with, with fragmentation and promote mutual trust. Governments should recognize the vital role of religious communities as unique stakeholders in humanitarian relief and promote consultation and cooperation with religious leaders. As an emblematic example, recently a partnership between a Catholic organization, uh, the Federation of Italian Evangelical Churches and the Valdesian Church has been established to promote a humanitarian project and facilitating the opening of humanitarian corridors to evacuate vulnerable individuals from a war environment. So the Catholic Church has been, has traditionally been a driving force in the implementation of international humanitarian law. According to Pope Francis, the abolitionist war is the goal that all men should pursue. Conflict, in fact, emphasized uh, dissipation of resources, which could be used for the promotion of peace and individual human development. However, in the meantime, he has encouraged every effort and humanizing the conflict and mitigating its impact. Indeed, humanitarian law has done a lot to reduce the negative implications of war. However, the widespread of information coming from theaters of war enhances the risk of a relativization of the seriousness of such a situation and of a globalization of this framework. <coughs> the role of the humanitarian organization, both religious and secular, should play in the framework of humanitarian law is the protection of victims of armed and non-armed conflicts, and this is an extremely important role. Francis solicits such charitable organizations to comply with the principles of humanity, neutrality, impartiality, and dependence. Coherence of these values is extremely important to humanitarian organizations to develop their action in areas of potential religious influence. Conflict where religious religion is an extremely divisive issue and increases the risk of extremism and tragedy. However, the Catholic teaching emphasizes that juridical and technical skills should proceed in harmony with the spiritual guidance as well as with the development of a culture of dialogue and peace in the pursuit of a genuine justice. Thank you very much.
Thank you. The third speaker in the session is Dr. Shuki Friedman, which will uh, talk about Judaism and Islam as a bridge between the people. Dr. Friedman is a member of the Faculty of Law at the Paris Academic Center. He's also uh, the Vice President of the Jewish uh, People Policy Institute. Between his areas of expertise are the relationship of religion and state, secular religion, ultra-Orthodox relations, the defense budget, Islamic law, and international law. Dr. Friedman, you have the stage. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sharf. Thank you uh, for organizing Asher, one of the other uh, partners for organizing this uh, conference, which is uh, very impressive and interesting. And uh, also um, um, raising hope that we succeed in one day the religions will become a bridge and a, a source for a relief and hope and not a source of a confront and wars. Um, and I want to take my few minutes to talk about this issue. With your permission, we'll start with uh, uh, some personal background, not the one that uh, Charlie um, described, professional one, one, but how did I got to the academic field I delve into as a PhD candidate. Long years ago, I'm not young already, and approximately 25 years, I learned in yeshiva, in Jewish scholarly uh, Beit Midrash University, if you like. And then I've been qualified as a rabbi by the chief rabbi of Israel, by the father of Rabbi Lau, you've just seen here yesterday. And then I went, it's okay. We went and I joined to the academy and learned also um, Islam and the Middle East studies with law. And it raised great interest within me to learn the Islam as religion and understand as a Jewish scholar, a rabbi, what Islam think about issues, which is considered to be important, what is the use of Islam. So I started to learn Islam. And my dissertation is focusing on public law in Islam, which means trying to understand the perspective of Islam on um, state and regime and how to um, legalize or constitutionalize the state. And then I, I had a comparative perspective on both Judaism and Islam. I always say it, I'm the person, only person in Israel who is both a rabbi and a Qadi. I'm not really a Qadi, but I'm really a rabbi. And uh, I started to think also, because I live here in Israel, suffering from rockets from the south and from the north and fighting within the state of Israel. How can we think on Judaism and Islam and Jews and Muslims here in Israel, not as a source for more confronts and more wars, and major cause, not the only cause, but the major cause for the wars internally and externally against Israel and within Israel, but as a potential for relief and a potential for building a bridge between the, between the two people. And I will try now to give you a very short and low resolution perspective of the two religions and on the points where I see the risks, but then on the points I see the potential to give us a hope that this, what looks to be enemies, might be also a potential to, to bridge the gaps we are suffering here within the Israel society and in the region. In both religions, peace. Islam is peace in a way. In, in both religions, the world. Peace is, is, is important. You know, the name of God in both religions is, is peace. And we are blessed each other with peace. So 
how comes if we are fighting for so many years? And you know, there is a perception in Israel sort of a um, misperception of the history of Jews within the Islamic State. It was very peaceful history, unlike with uh, the Jews under the cross. And it's, it's, it's misperception, unfortunately, as uh, Mark Cohen showed in his book. Uh, and the truth is that Jews under Islamic regime in different places um, around the region suffered also, uh, in, some, in some cases, prosper, and there have been a great relationship. But in other cases, suffered also from uh, um, being Jews under a sort of a cruel um, regimes and cruel uh, um, monarchs that uh, um, tried to eliminate or tried to restrict the place of Jews and the right of Jews uh, along the history. Having said that, in history as well, there are many points and very many terms where Jews and Muslims as religions have a great intersection and dialogue. And I can give you, I have a, had a full course in Bailan University on teaching how Islam influenced Judaism and Judaism influenced Islam. So there are many cases where Jewish scholars have discussions and dialogue on religious, is, religious issues with Islamic scholars, Muslim scholars. And we'll see it in the next panel, I think, right? There will be a kind of sort of a, a, a interreligious dialogue. So in the, in the past, there are points for hope, but also points for a, a, or some sources of, of pain. And But now let's look at the present. The main risks within the two religions in the treatment to each other is the three components of the religions being holistic religions, legal religions, and with a messianic horizon that excludes the other. The holistic, being holistic religions means two of the religions, Islam and Judaism, are the only legal holistic religions in the world. Islam uh, has the ambition to organize all reality and the same is Judaism. And therefore it seems like there is inevitable confrontation or clash between the religions. And for the future, the horizon that these two religions show to believers is a global rule of each other. Jews, as Asha mentioned, in a way, look to a future where the non-Jews, the Gentiles, will keep the seven commandments, but still the chosen people will be the Jews. In this day, God will rule the earth, but Jews will be in the center. Islam is the same, but for, for Muslims. So there, be, there is a confrontation today and in the future. So what is a source for hope? Five minutes, okay. What is the hope? I think, I think the hope is within the similarities, huge similarities between the two religions. And we'll quickly go through some of the major points. First of all, theology. Again, as a student of Islam, it was amazing to figure out how close we are when you're talking about theology. I, I think it's, it's, it's then I, I, you know, I learned the Rambam, the, theolo the greatest philosopher of the Jewish thought when I've been to yeshiva. And he mentioned many of the Muslim scholars and theologists and adopted some of the doctrines. Why? Because it's very similar. The exclusion of uh, any other gods, Musharakon, uh, Shituf, and the belief in one God is a core belief in the two religions, and therefore it's in a way, the way the two religions might promote the same religious vision for the world. The second point is 
in the divine physics. The way Islam and Judaism describe God's world in Kabbalah and in uh, Islamic writings about God's way of ruling the world is quite similar. And they elaborate a lot, but believe me, it's quite looks like the same people wrote the same things. I have a, a trick, I'm gonna teach it. I give the students two texts. One is Islamic and one is Jewish without recognizing them. They never figure out who wrote what, because it's the same, practically the same. Talking about being a legal religions, we are the same. Islam is Sharia, Islamic law. We have Halakha, the Jewish law, but it's organized in quite the same way, practically, theologically, and in a way that it's a legal system enable or force people to live in a certain track by the law, bind by the law. And in this perspective, Islam and Judaism are the only halachic or legal religions in the world and in details and in many other perspectives, there are similarities. And again, we can elaborate a lot, but there are similarities between what the Jewish God command choose to do and what the Islamic God command choose to do, which was the same. Furthermore, we could go to the texts. Islam adopted the Bible. The roots of Islam go to the same father, like you've mentioned around the day. So the prophets, except of uh, um, Jesus and Muhammad, who is Hatam and Albiya, the last prophet, are the same prophets for the Jews and for the Muslims, the same people. And finally, I think, in a way, in Asher, Professor Moore has mentioned in a labored about it, in the two religions, there is a place, a recognition in each other, specifically between Judaism and Islam, because Judaism and Islam does not accept uh, uh, Christianity, because they are Musharikun, they are uh, believe not necessarily in one God, but in triangles. So Judaism and Islam do accept each other, not equality, not with equality. There is a Haldima regime for Jews in Islam and Gel Toshav, a, a certain regime for non-Jews within, living within, within Jewish state or Jewish community, but it, it quite accepted. So, so Jews and, and Muslim do along the history and also today have the roots in, in the halakha, in the law to accept each other. And therefore, and I can give more examples and more points, the similarities, but therefore there are enough similarities to better live with the other religion and the other believers as a religious person. But unfortunately we fail, why? In both religions, there is no most rates of texts and teachings that have been produced by scholars along the years and a lot many ways to contemplate the sacred sources the bible and the quran and hadith and other sources and that seems the question is as rabbi jonathan sachs uh, pointed in a few of his writings is what you emphasize and what you leave out. And the major question for us the Jews, religious Jews, whoever want to contemplate Judaism, and the same for Islamic law scholars and contemplators, is what you emphasize. Where do you put your focus and what you raise, which texts you raise, and which are you throw out or give up. And therefore, if we successfully First of all, made scholars from two sides of Islam and Judaism choose to emphasize, cont contemplate in a certain way that enable us to live together, there'll be a chance to use religions as a bridge. If the 
scholars of two religions choose the other extreme way, we will fight for the end of the, way, of the days. And finally, I think it's a matter of also an education. The notions we have described very shortly here is not very common. To the most of the Jews, Islam is the enemy. To the most of the Muslims, Jews are the enemy. And most of the people in two sides do not have an idea about the other. If we successfully manage to educate people that there are many similarities and potential to dialogue on religion base, religious base, I think we might make the religions a bridge here within the state of Israel and in the region. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Friedman. A fourth speaker, the last but not uh, the least, is Professor Elizabeth Clark, which will talk about human dignity, religious difference, and building a culture of peace. Professor Clark is the Associate Director of Center for Law and Religious Studies from uh, Brigham Young University. She's an expert on religious freedom in Eastern Europe and comparative law and religion. She wrote over 40 chapters and articles and edited several books on comparative and US law and religion issues and religions in post-communist Europe, including co-editing religion during the Russian Ukraine conflict. Please, Professor Clark. Thank you. And a very warm thank you also to Asher, to Benun, whenever he comes back. Um, <laughs> and to Dr. And to, as I was about to say, Dr. Macedo, thank you. Um, and to your institutions. Really, this is a wonderful event, and I've learned so much and really enjoyed the opportunity. Thank you. Um, uh, as you mentioned, I've been working on law and religion in Eastern Europe for over 20 years. And, and I've recently been working after finish a book on Russian the, um, religion and the Russian Ukrainian conflict from 2014 to 2018. Um, I've been working on one that looks as a 30 years retrospective. So at any rate, what are my thoughts today? I'm going to frame the points and then use some illustrations from Eastern Europe, because that's part of the world that I know best. Um, and you all can tell me if this seems to apply elsewhere or not. Um, but we'll start from there. I have three main points that I'm hoping to make. First, that liberal democracy, peace, and religious flourishing go hand in hand. Second, that although there's a great deal of empirical data that suggests that religion fosters peace, historical and current counterexamples significantly problematize any kind of overly simplistic assumptions that increased religiosity necessarily means increased peace. In fact, and this is my argument, is it's actually more helpful and more accurate when you focus on freedom of religion or belief and peace than rather just religion and peace. Um, and I'll get into why that is. And my third point is looking at um, this question of freedom of religion or belief and trying to tackle head on the hardest situation. It sounds good in the abstract, but the hard part is when you're convinced that your neighbor is deeply wrong in a way that is going to have significant impact on you or them or others and do significant harm. So I guess I'm commenting on the, on the irony that human solidarity and peace that we've been talking about doesn't come, as we heard earlier this morning, merely from unity or just from religion per se, but you have this unity and peace when you have free, uh, then you, ha you have human solidarity and peace when you have freely chosen unity and freely chosen religion. Without those, there's this impulse to coerce. And while a state necessarily at times uses this impulse to coerce, ultimately coercion is violence. And so in order to have freely chosen religion and peace and unity, you, freedom will inherently be a part of peace. Okay, first point, liberal democracy, peace and religious flourishing go hand in hand. Um, let me give an example. 
I've been using this academic data set, Varieties of Democracy, to empirically track protections of religious freedom and civil rights across Eastern Europe and Central Asia for the last 30 years. And some countries have thrived religiously, politically. On the whole, it's the worst it's been in 30 years, almost 30 years, for millions of people. Um, region seen significant dem democratic and human rights backsliding and correlating with that backsliding in protections of freedom of religion or belief. Uh, the average values for the region on freedom of religion or belief hit their peak in 2010. And since then, and now are about the levels of 1993 or 1994. So, but I wanna spend, that's just to give an idea of sort of why this is as a practical matter an issue. Um, but I wanna look at theories because nothing so helpful is, a, nothing so practical is a good theory. Too soft? Okay. Um, so I want to look at three main theories that address why my abilities at the moment. <laughs> why authoritarianism is bad for religion and peace. Um, but then I also want to look at some empirical research about how, in turn, religion can buttress liberal democracy and peace. Right? So it works both ways. But let's start with why authoritarianism is a problem. Um, for religion and peace. Um, Ani Sarkisian is a political scientist in the United States who's looked at religious repression around the world, studied over 100 non-democratic countries, and looked at how political leaders decide which groups to repress where the repression shows up. And what she found is that religious repression is most likely to be in non-democratic countries that have a religious majority. And it gets used against minorities, including particularly minority variations of the minority faith. And her argument is that this is done by autocratic leaders in order to use the soft power of religion to shore up their own rule. It's a lot simpler than sending out the troops. Um, and so it's a low cost option and increases their popularity and support. And you see this over and over again in Eastern Europe, with Islamic and other minorities repressed in Central Asia and, hung and Hungary, discriminating against everyone except for the big three religions when they changed the registration law, Russia banning Jehovah's Witnesses, sort of over and over again, the autocratic countries would be very difficult for religion. And the second uh, sort of theory and approach is that of um, Finke and Grimm, who tie government restrictions and, on religion and social hostilities. Now this tallies with where we just came from um, because she shows why authoritarians restrict minorities and then Gurma Finke show the next step, which is that that leads to social hostilities, which is why autocratics, well, all autocratic leaderships will inevitably have um, problems with peace and stability in their countries. Um, a Pew Research Center had tracks for a number of years, both government restrictions, social hostilities, and you can see the correlations pretty clearly. Um, and so you can see this in Eastern Europe as well. I mean, Russia has gone from sort of high restrictions and government social hostilities on the Pew rankings to very high government restrictions to very high in, in 20, 2009 to very high in both in 2010. And now it's one of the highest in the world. Um, and so the third major theory that's helpful about looking at why authoritarian leaders are so problematic for peace as well as for religion is the democratic peace theory. This is the idea that democracies are significantly less likely to engage in armed conflict with other democracies. Now, this has been widely shown. People have arguments about why it's the case, but it seems quite clear. Um, and sadly, we have a prime example of it in the last few months uh, where a non-democracy invaded a democracy. Um, with enormous human collateral, over six million citizens who have fled. Um, there's also additional reasons that liberal democracy and religion and peace go hand in hand. Um, and I'm gonna look at that more now from how religion and peace freely chosen buttresses liberal democracy, that this is a, a virtuous cycle where they can help each other. Um, I just finished an article sort of going through in extensive detail um, documented pro-social benefits from religion. And so some of this comes from that. Um, 
uh, some of it's political theory, some of it's empirical research. Uh, political philosophers explain that um, religion buttresses liberal democracy through several ways. One is the idea of social capital. We heard some about this morning, right? This idea that which the active citizens are more civically active, they're positive about the community, they're more likely to vote, to volunteer, including in non-religious causes, to talk to their neighbors, to give to charity. Um, they build this reservoir of reciprocity, trust, trustworthiness um, that help facilitate trade community life. Uh, Robert Putnam, who's sort of the father of social capital studies, has argued that faith communities in which people worship together are arguably the single most important repository of social capital in America. And in America, it also comprises half of all personal philanthropy and volunteering. And I know that the US is a little bit of an outlier on this question of personal philanthropy, um, but I think social capital points uh, equally apply elsewhere. So religious communities help people acquire values and skills that they can use to participate in politics effectively. Religion also, and we heard this morning, actually, yep, provides a reservoir of social norms and deep commitment that it's not um, that we bring to the table. Uh, in many cases, these are democratic norms such as tolerance, reflective thinking, generosity, altruism, law abidingness and reverence, seeing there's more here than oneself. Religious difference provides a model for democratic citizens of how do we disagree agreeably at its best. Uh, religious beliefs can also compensate for the neutrality of modern liberalism to notions of the good life. I mean, that's an inherent part of modern liberalism is that there is no commitment to single good, but religion comes and can provide the goods and the, um, the sense of value, sense of community, that you into the engagement that liberal democracies need to flourish. Really what they're doing is, is they're giving this thick component to social life and combating the atomization of modern liberal state. I heard uh, this morning also about the epidemic of loneliness. They, the, giving these values not only holds people together, but also holds generations together because it's a vehicle for intergenerational transfer of social norms. Um, religion also has a direct impact on peace and human solidarity, right? I've been talking about how it buttresses liberal democracy, but directly on peace, religions have served as mediating institutions, checks on state power, providing a voice, to challenge reigning social norms. Um, studies show that religions associated with the majority of nonviolent campaigns for political change has played a role in over half of the democratic movements this during the time of that particular study. Um, religious organizations and individuals play a role in mediating an end to conflicts, contributing to transitional justice, who are involved in eight out of 10 um, truth commissions set up by countries. Um, and religious disengagement is correlated with increased racial and ethnic intolerance and movement away from the political middle. Um, brief example, Ukraine, religion has been, religious freedom has been very open, religion has flourished, and you saw this starting with like the Euro Modern, where clergy would come together as a unifying force in the country to pray together to support national unity. Uh, particularly after the invasion of 2014, you've seen religious civil society flourish. Uh, mobilizing to assist with helping soldiers, helping wounded, helping non-combatants and displaced persons. So we've got liberal democracy, religious freedom, and peace going hand in hand. Um, reducing hostilities, supporting and letting both governments and religion flourish. Um, and religions contribute to peace. But in some, as you probably realize, it's not entirely that simple. Um, what we call the ambivalence of religion makes it really hard to speak with any accuracy about religions as necessarily leading to peace. There's of course lots of social science research I just went through, but if you think of history, you think of current experience, 
you see that even if religion is merely being used as a marker, religion risks being instrumentalized, when it is, in particular in cases of war, in, in Russia, Ukraine here, um, or even can be an active contributor to hostilities. So religion can be a force for peace, yet studies show the religiosity of the country doesn't affect the local peace in the country, right? Religion posts values needed in liberal democracies, yet for thousands of years, religion's also been used to prop up monarchies and repressive governments. Variations of the same belief can promote liberal democracy or pro-social beliefs, while other members of the same faith may oppose them, right? So we've got a problem here. Um, and it's the problem of, of negative externalities of religion is frankly not, those kind of negative externalities is not exclusive to religion, but also faces others who advocate for a thick communitarian approach. I, I like the work of uh, this thoughts by uh, Talis, who's arguing that communitarians need a way so that well, I'll see what he says, which essentially social and encumbered selves could adopt a self-critical stance that could weed out and correct oppressive, intolerant, and homogenizing tendencies of community without evoking liberal notions of civil liberties and individual rights, right? You need both the thick side of what religion has to offer in terms of building community and norms and values, but you also need, um, and you, but you need to be able to do that without resorting to what the state has in terms of human rights. Um, he says, in other words, they need a conception of community that's at once binding and plastic, a politics that was both formative and fluid. And so for religion, this kind of opportunity to have a self-critical stance to weed out oppressive aspects or tolerant aspects of the community um, is only found with religious freedom, not just religion alone. So when religion's in a legal regime that ensures exit rights and minimizes restrictions on religious freedom, religion can be unifying and binding and plastic and so forth. And so that's what my second point is really that religious freedom is a much more helpful category for thinking about religion and peace than just religion by itself. Um, there's not as much empirical work done, but there is quite a bit and it's fascinating. Um, Religion is most closely associated with war, terrorism, lack of democracy, and repression of other beliefs in countries that are themselves religiously unfree. Right? They don't have religious freedom. It will not be doing good things in the community. Of religions that can operate freely and that choose to endorse religious freedom are more likely to serve as this is all empirical events here I'm citing are more likely to serve as mediators in conflict situations. Countries with lower levels of government restrictions have fewer hostilities, higher levels of individual well-being. Religious freedom often shows up as a bundled right with other civil rights, since political stability, economic goods, education of women, you know, lots of things. Um, because I think it, what, un, what's underlying this is that religion can't offer the social goods it has to offer except when people choose to do so freely. When people can choose their faith freely, then religion can flourish and bless society. Um, I mean, Ukraine's a great example as well. They've had a very good track record on religious freedom for many years. I and mean, this has expanded the pool of people who care about their country and can contribute to it. I mean, obviously, as you know, it currently has a Jewish president, has a Greek Catholic prime minister right now. It's also previously had a speaker of parliament an acting president for time, who was a Protestant. And they've had another Jewish prime minister. And this has all been completely unremarkable. Mm -hmm. It's because of the level of freedom for religion in that country. Um, but as you also see in Ukraine, protecting freedom of religion belief, as stable as it may help your country to become, it may not protect you from an authoritarian neighbor who does not protect freedom of religion belief. Um, and this moves into my final point, which is that freedom of religion belief is hardest to maintain when you're convinced your neighbor is deeply wrong in a way that has significant impact on you or them, temporal or spiritual. See this in places like Azerbaijan or Central Asia where there's worries about um, minority Muslims in particular or of conversion. Um, this is seen to have 
I mean, part of this is the religious beliefs about apostasy and the costs of this. Part of it's also physical costs of worried uh, extremism, and part of it's just that they have autocratic regimes. Um, and I'd contrast that with Ukraine, that's, I mentioned, quite, been very tolerant on these issues. Um, but what you see since the invasion in 2014 is that the tolerance is getting pushed and it's getting very hard to maintain. Um, the, one of the major branches of orthodoxy in Ukraine is technically underneath the Moscow patriarchy under, uh, under the Russian Orthodox Church. Um, and so there's been increased discrimination against this particular branch. Um, they're not pr permitted to have chaplains in the military. The government has passed laws that make it easier for parishes to leave them and go to the other Orthodox churches. Um, there are bills requiring them to identify themselves as being connected to the Russian Orthodox Church, saying, hi, we're your enemy. Um, there's now, of course, some bills to ban it them entirely. Uh, they, they're not to a point that they'd pass yet, but they may get there. Um, these are very difficult because the security concerns are very real. Um, sometimes the dignity of difference is extremely hard to maintain. It's not a nice, easy concept that we can talk about and go home. Um, so I guess in conclusion, I just want to say that freedom of religion and belief, freedom of religion and belief matters, not only because it promotes liberal democracy, human solidarity and peace, but also more importantly is because of this reflection of human dignity. Now we've heard several people mention today this idea of being created in the image of God and the powerful image that that is in terms of human dignity and seeing the divine and those around us. Um, but I think in some ways, an even more powerful image um, that ties into this problem of what do you do when your neighbor is wrong and are going to kill you or harm themselves or harm someone else. Um, and let me say, you know, no religious freedom is without limits. That goes without saying. But there's still a fair amount more that one needs to give than one's comfortable with in many cases. So I think the most powerful image in this is also from the creation story in the Abrahamic traditions, but it's the story of Adam and Eve leaving the Garden of Eden and having transgressed the commandment they were given. And as I understand, in Jewish traditions, many of them, they say they sort of give up their garments of light and God gives them clothing. He respects their dignity, even after they've done the opposite of what he had commanded them. He gives them the right to be wrong and still be treated with dignity. Um, my view is much harder than agreeing just as a general matter to the dignity of other people because the right to be wrong comes with a cost. The others will err, they will leave the faith, they will do spiritual physical harm to others. This is often very tragic, um, but my hope is that we continue to commit to keep treat people with dignity that expand the protections for freedom of belief in a way is that will create human solidarity, strengthen liberal democracy, and encourage peace. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Clark. Now we will move to the second part of this session that there uh, will be a short uh, part. We have five seconds in this part. Uh, however, the speakers want to comment or add uh, to any remarks is uh, welcome to do so. The audience can also, of course, ask questions if there are any. I just want to make a short remark and thank uh, Professor Maoz for his uh, keynote speech. He mentioned in the final remarks of his talk, the sentence of the US Declaration of Independence, all the men are created equal, which is a, a particular uh, history that few people know. Uh, that sentence was invented by an Italian, uh, which, by the way, was not Catholic. OK. Uh, actually, this is, a, if, you, if you do a short research on Google, you will find the resolution of the US Senate with the history of that sentence, which is, is fascinating. So uh, Thomas Jefferson had a friend 
His name was uh, Philip Mazzei, Filippo Mazzei. He was living very close to Thomas Jefferson in Monticello, Virginia. Uh, Filippo Mazzei was a staunch anti-Catholic in Italy. Uh, he was forced to basically immigrate because he was excommunicated. And uh, he then worked uh, as a diplomat for the state of Virginia. Then he worked in France, worked for, you know, was a, a globalist by that time already. And he was the guy who convinced Thomas Jefferson to have all the men are created equal in the Declaration of Independence. So already at the time when in Italy there were strong struggles between the Catholic Church and uh, intellectuals to own the notion of human dignity, then then had global effects. And when the people mention those words, I always try to remind the legacy of Mazzei, which is a forgotten man that fought for that war to be in that Declaration of Independence that then inspired so many people all over the world. Uh, and I actually think that we as Italians don't, don't stress that enough. So when I have the opportunity, I always take the opportunity to remind that. Thank you. Just a, a footnote, uh, did he inspire Thomas Jefferson and Monticelli? That, uh, that 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 no, statement. No, the... You know, I'm just joking with you because at Monticello there were slaves there, you know, oh, okay. and they were not created equal, you know. Oh, so sure. that... <laughs> um, Sorry. Uh... No, I mean, I, well, I mean, I had these exchanges with Ganun before when we were discussing how our personal experience. Or, or how our different histories shape us. Uh, and I mean, this is a, a, a very important debate in the US today, you know, how we read the past. If we read it uh, with what was there at the time, was Jefferson and uh, Matze were discussing these things. Uh, my opinion is that uh, uh, Matze and Jefferson himself, unfortunately, didn't have the intellectual structure to understand the huge discrimination that they had under their eyes. Uh, with, the, with the intellectual framework that we have today, they should have, you know, uh, had equality, real equality among all the people. But still, to have those wars there then trigger the global movement to recognize the, Italian, the, 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 the legacy of equality and be able to say today, for us here, that what was there was not real equality, and there were people which were enslaved and so on. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you emphasize in your presentation um, that the real question is what to do with your neighbor if your neighbor is wrong, right? What are you saying? You want to answer? Well, I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, at some level, it shouldn't matter what your neighbor, whether they're wrong or not. You treat them with respect and dignity and uphold the law. But my point is just that that's usually when, as human beings, we tend to want less to protect others, or we tend to find good justifications for not protecting them. Um, when we think, I mean, I think you see it, you see the Ahmadiyya Muslims in Pakistan and elsewhere, right? That they're seen as wrong or some minority faiths in the Jehovah's Witnesses in Russia, right? That, that somehow being wrong makes them dangerous. That sort of theological concepts start to spill into practical application of law and that that can be dangerous when we do that. Thank you. Uh, Professor Shira Worthy. Hi, thanks. Um, the different talks all raise the issue that I'm realizing has a different structure than I've always thought of it, of religion and state. So firstly, tolerance grew up as a term out of religious wars, not religious peace. Historically, it's 1688, it's Locke's letter on toleration, that just realized it was too costly. Um, and it privatized religion as its solution. Um, the 
idea of tolerance, we had three terms, tolerance, religious freedom, and respect that Professor uh, was proposed. And I think respect is actually somewhat different from religious freedom because religious freedom again is neutral, but respect is requesting a positive approach. Thirdly, when you talked about Islam and Judaism and so forth, I think that we have to ask, when does religion draw on non-religious traditions that uh, then introduce into what were very uh, coercive, unitary religious uh, expectations and structures? So I'm saying religious war is one way. Two religions have to co-reside together. Another way is the influx of non-religious ideas. Also, I really want to emphasize that when I teach students in this day, oh, religion is the cause of conflict. The two major killers of the 20th century were non-religious. They were Nazism and Stalinism. But then you have to ask, and I was challenged in class, so what's the difference between religion and ideology? And I had to think, 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 and write my professors. I was a young teacher. And I think this is where the idea of transcendence came in, whereas a non-religious structure will not admit anything that transcends it. But religions that claim total power become ideologies. So I'm saying the mix of the state and religion and um, religious freedom comes from many sources. And whether or not religion uh, acts in one way or another resides within a whole civic culture. That's what I'm saying. And can't be separated. And by the way, I think we have to admit it was Protestantism. It was Protestantism that introduced through the privatization and individualization, I'm not Protestant, okay, of, of conscience that, uh, which could be taken from, you know, Locke is full of biblical references but it's not strictly one religious tradition that suddenly discovered, oh, we have respect for others. Thank you. I would like to thank all the speakers uh, for the interesting uh, presentation. Thanks also uh, for the good remarks. I wish you a, a fascinating conference later today and tomorrow. Thank you all. It's teaching at Yale. And the same phrase is the So what's the difference? Why is religion different?